I could see like he was eating something because it looked like different than what he was doing. Yeah, basically pixelated, right? So I can, I think each face was like four pixels at, at most, right? Um, really, because our video showed it was a bit more than that. Because I'm, you know, it's, it's like facing right me, right? I mean, the, the whole frame was me, so even if you saw, but like people in the back, right? You probably took only one pixel, so I know that there's somebody and not somebody kind of stuff. But that was not the most annoying part. I mean, it was kind of annoying if you, if anybody wanted to say something, right? But I could see, um, like, like you were raising your hand, right? So I, I couldn't make it his hand, but I, I, I know that something, you know, some line sticking up has to be a hand, right? So I can, I can kind of work with that, right? <laughs> but the audio was horrible, because especially at, towards the end, like the, the echo was so bad that I would say one, and then like after one or two seconds, I hear, so I, I don't know if you, if you heard, the, like I was going through that one, two, three seconds, right? I'll say one, and then I'll hear the one after two seconds. So I'll be like, so does that make sense? And, <laughs> doesn't make sense, right? So I can't really talk to something where everything I say, so um, like if you call India or something, you usually have like a few milliseconds afterwards your echo, right? So you're kind of used to dealing with that. But this is like a person like talking back to me after, after a while. I think once it came back after seven seconds, so I said something and moved on, and then like, somebody <laughs> said, oh, you know, like still the same thing, right? Um, so obviously the network was flawed and that's because there are 438 uh, systems people in one hotel, so the hotel was like just dying, right? <laughs> I mean, this, this, um, they didn't have enough network bandwidth. So it was fine to start with, but kind of deteriorated. Um, the round trip time, I think, was fine. It was like, you know, we're saying like, I forget what I said, like 60 or 70, 200 millisecond. Um, but clearly, I don't think the tech, the, that network was good enough for us to, um, do a video conference, right? So I hope I hope that gave a bad example, but at least that's a state of the art and um, what people are trying to do and stuff, right? If it had worked really good, but you can actually see what I'm what I'm talking about, and um, I could see you guys, you know, in some fashion, that would be so nice, right? Like I wouldn't have had to travel over there or or what have you, right? Um, but uh, on good days, it's not so bad. I mean, I've, I've talked to Singapore, and it's it's fine. Um, and JP said you you talk to you South America, right? Peru, yes. I uh, yeah, actually I did it like three times this week. Um, and that's better than. Well, the thing is, if you do it the later, you do it the better it comes. So when I talk at like three or four a.m., the connection is perfect. If you talk at like seven p.m., you got a lot of frame drop. And it's kind of a, mm -hmm. a lot of. The sound distribution never suffers, but the video suffers a lot. Mm -hmm. But if any of you have done video conferencing, I think I think the um, it's wonderful tool, right? Especially you don't have to travel, and if you have family elsewhere and stuff, right? Um, I just wish the technology end to end would get better. That it'll make this useful, right? And um, and I don't I don't think it's the latency. I think it's the everything else, right? Um, so. Yeah, I like to finish finish off that that topic, right? So the, the you know so um, in terms of what Seva was trying to do, right? Um, they were trying to tag everything that you see, and you know, in, in fact, you know, figure out which which frame has has what contents, right? And there is so there's no notion of privacy here because they're not worried about privacy here. Or they you could use the system to enforce privacy, right? In terms of, so if, if the video is supposed to only record me, and if one of you were to walk over here, the camera can figure out what frames you are there, what frames you are, where you are, and mask you out, right? Rather than manually doing that. Yes, go. Um, do you have, could you bring printouts of the other presentation from last week? Next time? On the website. Oh, it's on the website, okay. Yes, it's actually on the website. So, so they, they are moving towards uh, RFID, right? Uh, RFID is, is, is the um, the one that a lot of people are excited about. Um, like Walmart and Alice wants to use that to track track the, the shipments and stuff. So hopefully we'll have RFID tags embedded on each of you. Um, and I don't know why you say hopefully. 
Uh, at least that's what the goal of the project is, right? No, no. So all this technology has a good good side and a bad side, right? So in some sense, actually, I think if you if I can identify who you are, then you can enforce policies to to not to to you know to make sure that I, I can uh, deal with the privacy, right? So we can selectively Ask stalk you. people. Like, 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 for example, right now, right? Like, I, I, I uh, allow myself to be recorded, right? But I have to get permission from all of you, or I can't show the video at all, right? Because, or else I have to manually go and say. So, if I ask permission and, and like, everyone except one person gave permission, right? That means I cannot put that video on that one person, right? So, which either means that I don't record anybody which is what I'm doing right now, or I go manually and then take find where that one person is and keep uh, removing them, right? So if you had RFID, if I had one of these system, right, and, and we implement it basically as whoever is not supposed to be there, it essentially looks at each frame that he could be and then removes you, right? That, that could be a, so that may be a right way to go in terms of, respecting your privacy and still being able to work with others, right? Right now the solution is I can't do, I can't you know, record any, any of you because I, I, don't, I can't get permission from everyone, right? So that's one way to spin it, right? So, so in that case, so the question is, your, the, the, the new passports from most countries, you know, the urging of US would, would go towards something that can be read from afar, right? The, um, how many of you have a new passport? After the after they put the, I just got it two days ago. Okay, so yours yours can be tra tracked, right? Oh, I think after so after, I, I think after November. I, think I, don't have it with me. I think after November they did it, right? Okay. I think my son got it like October fifteenth, which he didn't have it. So I don't know how it looks like. Oh, I think see I it. may have actually, it may I may have gotten it October thirty first. Not sure, either October thirty first or November first. So there, there was one date before which you didn't have to have, after which everyone will have. So even if you didn't have it when your passport expires, you'll, it'll be. Uh, Did they increase the security on it? Because they were pretty easy to clone. I have no idea what okay. they, they do, because I don't, I don't keep up with that. But um, it's the government stuff where they say, you know, this is, you know, it's probably illegal for you to talk about how you can break this thing, right? Um, so whatever, right? So at the least, at the least, good people are supposed to be able to read that, right? Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> whatever, right? But I'm, I'm saying, like the, the notion of RFID and uh, all these things are slowly keeping in, and, and um, depending on a lot of lot of companies do have those. Uh, like you know, ninety five had one of these active badges where it figures out where you are within a lab. But this is this is Xerox Park, so this is most for research. Um, but the company still lives and they're making products, so it's not all for research. So companies, you know, do do that, right? And most companies give you a um, one of the ID tags with with something inside, right? Um, because it's not just a thin thing. It, it look, you know, it looks kind of big, right? So, um, so I, I I don't think the technology itself is bad. I think what you can do with it is is bad, which is true for every technology, right? So regardless, so their their goal is if you have all have RFIDs. Then you can actually, so they're, they're trying to develop technology, that's the new thing to figure out. I think they can go up to 30 feet uh, with passive, uh, where you don't have to have any, any battery thing. Uh, so ideally they would like the camera to have some kind of a way to read, read your tags, right? Like, you know, so without doing all these algorithms, it only reads like this. But I was told the traditional antenna right now is like this big. So it's like this big, so. You probably don't want to put it on your camera because otherwise your camera will look like one of those, you know, the space heater kind of thing, um, which will be kind of scary because if I have a camera with like this big thing pointing at you, um, right? So, so that that is that project. So the the one we we look at today is the other stuff, which is using video cameras, video sensors to, uh, you know, the the super sized Big Brother stuff, right? So whatever you have in in England, uh, London, what what have you, move over, right? So we want to make it, want hypersize it, and, and have lots of cameras, and look at you know what what they can sensor, how they work, and all those things, right? So how many of you seen those sensors, like the video sensors on 
um, road intersections and stuff within South Bend. How many of you actually try to notice how many cameras that are out there which are watching you? Uh, I think there were maybe four on an intersection line. Yeah, you said there's a, they've had them for over 10 years, like with sensors in the road and then cameras. Yeah, but I'm saying like, like everyday life, right? Like all this, like, so like if you drive in Atlanta, right? Like the, the main highway, like every lamppost, there's one camera looking down, right? And over here, I don't know who's watching those cameras well uh, in Detroit they have a service I don't know they might this this is probably what they <laughs> use the cameras for is they have um, a service that goes out and like if somebody's car break, breaks down they go out and help them just to clear accidents because mm -hmm. that's one of the mm -hmm. things that clogs up traffic yeah I mean so hopefully I mean I hope that's what they're doing using this for right? I hope they're, they're not using this to see what time you're going home. I'm hoping that somebody's looking this to see if there's a traffic jam or whatever, right? Which is, that's what you hope. I mean, I don't, I don't know. And a lot of, lot, of, lot of places actually put them on the web, right? Like if you look in Seattle, you can actually look on the highway to see how the traffic is so you can kind of change what you do, right? So th these, are, these are systems which are similar to that one and you're trying to do different stuff. So one of the <laughs> projects that they are involved in is like to, uh, I think I mentioned before, to, um, put a camera across the whole Oregon coast, right? I think it's like 1,300 miles or something, right? Put a camera facing the ocean, and they want to enable other research. So one of the things they want to see is how the tide surge comes in and goes out, right? So there's one way is to send a graduate student who sit there and watch the whole day, right? <laughs> so you can hire 1,300 students and make them sit across the whole beach. Um, which may or may not be bad depending on how cold it is or whatever, right? I, I, like in, in my um, when I, in my grad school, my roommate was in oceanography. So over winter, they go on the person submersible, the Alvin, and go submerge, right? So they are they are stuck in usually in Hawaii because that's the like the sites he they go. So they complain yeah. bitterly about like how they miss all the snow. They are kind of stuck in um, the weather, right? So Oregon is not a bad place to be stuck in the in the beach or something, right? But regardless, like, so that's so the, the the researchers do not know how the the surge looks like. They know that high tide means that water comes up and low tide means water goes down, but they don't know what what they're looking for, right? So the hard part is you want to be watching a, a phenomenon that you don't know how it looks like, and you're trying to figure out how it looks like. So. One easy way to do that is to collect all the video and get all the video back to your lab and then try to look to see what really happened, right? And that, as you can imagine, is not a good solution because if you have cameras, you know, 1,300 cameras, and you want to stream all this content back to somewhere, you're going to produce a whole bunch of data, right? You're going to produce so much data that you probably can't deal with it. I mean, plus the, the infrastructure and all won't be there to get all the video to you, right? So you would want some kind of a processing, but you can't really process because if you may you might have actually turned off the event that you're looking for. So if you're looking, so if your algorithm was to look for changes and you expect like one centimeter across the frame kind of changes, and it turns out that it was actually doing half a centimeter change, then your algorithm may never get triggered and you you don't see it, right? So you want these things to be programmable. So the, the point is you don't want them to be statically set there and uh, figure out what's going on, right? So in, in terms of like the, if you're looking for cars, right, it's fairly good assumption to say that cars probably cost way more than 2,000 pounds. So you kind of, like, you know, those little uh, sensors they have on the road, like the little cables and stuff, they assume cars are more than 2,000 pounds and that's kind of fine. But in this case, you don't know what, you don't know what a car is, you don't know what you're looking for, so you can't do this stuff. So you want these things to be programmable, right? You want these things to be resource constrained, um, mostly because of the cost and where they're, where they're set up and stuff. And when they're actually doing this, you, you notice a whole bunch of things that you never thought of, right? I sort of alluded to this with the, with the London stuff. Like, London has all these cameras looking over, and one of the things I, I, I learned was no one actually cleans them, right? So if you look at those things, they look so, they look so dirty because they're out in the environment, right? So unless you have a way to kind of go clean them up like the Mercedes Benz have this little um, wiper on the on the light, right? Unless you have one of those, you're kind of stuck with what what whatever you have, right? 
And one of the things you notice is if you put these things on the on the beach front looking into the water, right? And you have so so if you have like a beach flat beach and you have this nice thing sticking out and looking down, right? Birds love them, right? Because suddenly they find something to stand up and do what they do. So somebody has to go clean up behind them, right? So one of the things I noticed was if you do a solar panel, right? So for energy, solar panel seems like a nice idea because, I mean, it's practically the, the nothing to block the view except for bird dropping. So after a few, few little bit, bird droppings cover the whole thing, right? So you have to solve problems like that. So the other thing they did was use um, wind energy because it's constant uh, wind coming through. They also noticed that wind, the, the fins means either you kill birds because it's, it's rotating fast, right? Or the birds kill it because like if a seagull comes and sits on these things, then it bends or it, it falls apart, right? So it has to be protective against like a big bird sitting on it, in which case it's strong enough to kill the bird if it comes in the wrong way, right? So that, um, you know, most of you might know that like the big windmills kill birds and people kind of choose to ignore them. <laughs> but in this case, if you have like, this across the entire organ coast and you're killing one bird a day, right? It's not gonna go too well, right? So, so you gotta deal with those kind of issues. You gotta figure out what uh, other issues like how to encode, how to transmit and uh, all those things. And that, that's part of um, what these people are working on. And again, I asked them for um, video sequence of something uh, I haven't heard back yet, but um, if I get one, try to bring it to class. Right. So in terms of the, the hardware, different groups want to look at different kinds of stuff. There's a project going on at uh, John Hopkins, and I don't have the picture or the information about, uh, about them uh, yet. So essentially, they, they, these people are hardware people, so they're building a CCD and the processing built into the same unit, right? So essentially, the idea would be if you build this whole wall out of this computing unit, right? It senses and it processes, right? So ideally, you'll have this wall which sees the, everything in this room, and it processes in in situ and then <coughs> figures out what happens, right? That's one way to go. So there it's a different way of looking at the stuff. So you kind of spread it across the across the wall or whatever and it sees everything, right? It's kind of freaky because then it sees everything, right? So what what these people are looking at was more of a, if people who are interested in, in, in sensor network, you know, they, they use the the mode kind of platform, which is a two hundred or 400 megahertz uh, uh, ARM, ARM processor, right? And so one, one, of the, one of the problems that they had to face was the, the kind of interface, uh, the, those, those platforms. So, so if you choose that, that much processing power, then that restricts what kind of a video you can have, right? You can't, you can't obviously have something like a HD TV because you can't encode and all those things. We'll see in the next slides what, what those are. And here, one of the things that um, we tried to look at um, in Notre Dame here is like the wire processor. And I don't know how many of you uh, play with those things. And those are fairly small, depending on what your perspective is. So you can have them up to um, 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter, which is like you know, this big. Um, this particular picture is a 800 megahertz processor. You still have the heat fin and everything, but it's much more powerful. It can. It has a uh, decoder built in. You wish there's encoder, but there's no encoder. But it can do. Um, it can. It can actually keep up with the um, 640 by 480, 30 hertz kind of processor, right? And of course, it takes more energy. Of course, um, this changes some of the stuff that they were to worry about. If you use this platform, you can you can do whatever video you want, and you move the stuff to something else. Whereas with a with a smaller platform. You have to worry about what kind of uh, what kind of video, what kind of uh, things you can do, right? So they actually had to spend a lot of time trying to get a USB cam to work for for their project. So that's that is one of their first papers in multimedia 2003. You know, to build a sensor platform with a USB camera, right? Yeah, so again, so um, this is what I was just mentioning before, right? One of, the, one of the nice things about sensor network research 
so you can either do it in you know assuming everything but the the real what you want to do is like deploy these things and try to figure out what happens right um, so that 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 brings up issues that you you probably never thought of thought of right so like for example like they never imagined that seagulls are very active right till you build these things and then you find out that solar energy is not a good way to go because um, can they just put those metal spike things they have on buildings um, Birds you you so the, so his point was you can if you make it powerful enough that you can kill it, yes. Well, no, no, no. I, but the the like they have this in Paris. They had a lot of pigeons. But they they just have like a rack of they were just thin metal spikes that they I don't think they could kill a bird. But birds but he said like if it, if it's like if it's milder milder stuff, they kind of learn to work around it. Right? If it's sharp enough to hurt them, then they don't come back. But if it's sharp enough to hurt them, if they kind of land on it, you have a, you know, well, I, I, think, the, I think you're just gonna have to take the hit, you know. I don't think it'll go well, especially in Oregon, right? You don't want to say... You just need to electrocute it so that they get a little shot. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, Yes, you, you can use a lot of destructive mechanisms. Right? You can you can shoot them, right? If they land, you just like this little blast and go away, right? <laughs> but it's just, never just case the housing with metal, and when they get close enough to it, it'll shotgun. And that way, the solar panel doesn't have any problems. Okay, so uh, I don't know how many of you've been to Oregon, so that is not going to go anywhere, right? Like <laughs> in the West Coast, you're not going to have things which electrocute them or you know spike them. <laughs> If you blew them up enough to where they weren't recognizable, <laughs> you know, you know this. Okay, you have you know. So that, those are not options, especially for people who are doing this for research. So if you're in military, you can do all this stuff, right? So nobody's going to know what you're doing or like, you can say this is what I'm gonna do in Iraq or whatever, right? But you can't do this in, in, in Oregon and you can poison them too, right? We like this idea. But he, you know, he said none of them work. So they, they actually tried spikes, but okay. the spikes have to be like sharp enough and long enough and strong enough that they hurt them, that they don't that they don't land, right? And he said that there are, you you will be amazed like how many birds there are, how many different kinds of birds there are, and they all love this thing because it's like kind of sticking out and like some place to stand, right? Other than going and landing on the on the ground or flying off to a cliff or something, right? So they just love these things. So depending on, so you, you kill one or the other, right? So actually I think if you build like a really long spike like this, then you keep the seagulls away. But you probably kill a few of them on the, on the side and, um, no, that, that's, that's not mean. a good Can you get them, right, so that's fine. What? Seagulls are mean, so. <laughs> Can you get a material that's like slippery? And then, so if they try to land on it, they'll like. So, so that that that's part of the research, right? Like, you know, if if you can come up with some slippery thing which will hold or whatever, right? So, so no. So if you look at different projects, they they all have to come up with these different things. Like there, there's there's a project where they were trying to see how uh, there's an orca island or something off of Maine, and they're trying to figure out how these birds nest and all those things, right? So they had to put one inside the nest to measure the temperature and and stuff of the birds, right? And you have to deal with different things. You know, the, the chicks probably want to eat the thing and you have to deal with the stuff, right? Some of them work, some of them don't work, but it's a ongoing kind of stuff, right? I think, I think Notre Dame, they, they wanted to put one inside the lake. Then after a while, you get slime built on it, right? You have to keep cleaning the slime and all those things, so. Some of them work. So in this case, there may be something, they haven't found something, right? So if you, um, there's something else. So, but I'm saying you have to worry about those, right? The, the, the hard part is, whatever you do, should not ab obstruct the, the view, right? So you, it's not okay to put them into a like, nice uh, metal cylinder um, where none of them bother, them bother you because you still have to be able to see outside. So it has to be uh, clean. It also has to be kind of sticking out, right? So the, what, what, if they put it on the ground level, the birds probably won't attack them so much. And you won't be able to see anything either. So, um, so, th so those are those are things that they had to worry about, um, and they had I think 1,200 or 1,500 some uh, amount of cameras. So I guess the satellite wouldn't help them. I mean, like if you just use the satellite, could you get the same resolution that you'd want with? 
Um, achieve the same goal? I don't know. I, I'm, I'm guessing not, right? Because if you're trying to see how the water level raises, so you'd have to kind of watch from this angle, right? Like you have to kind of watch the... Uh, the right angle. Yeah, not from the top, right? No, if you had a... Your, the Earth is here and your satellite is here and your coast is here, you could get... You could get a they don't see well that way because they're seeing through more of the atmosphere. Oh, yeah, that's true, I suppose. But, I mean... So why do they want to watch the coast? They just want to, like, watch... Oh, they want to see how the ocean raises for, um, with the high tide because apparently the you know if there's a some some oceanographic stuff right like if there's like sand underneath then that the the hypothesis is that affects how the water raises so you want to, trying to figure out where there's sand something for something right um, I don't know I mean oceanographers want to do something with this stuff right so. Um, but, but there, are, there are other projects that are not so researchy, like, like the, in the Caspian Sea, right? Apparently, all the oil pipelines, they want to watch every uh, mile or so because um, people want to uh, blow up those pipelines, right? So you want to watch those things. Um, I don't know what you do if you see somebody blowing up. I think somebody mentioned, right? So, um, well, they just put a bunch of cameras down in Texas to watch the border. Oh. You guys know about that? Yeah. Why is this Yeah. Stuff? yeah. Uh, no, no. The, the Texas government basically put a bunch of cameras to look at the border, and there's a website you can go. Yeah, you could call somebody to and say the this. The point is that there's already crazy militia nut jobs looking yeah. at the border anyway. That, <laughs> you know, this way it's just simpler. And so the point is you can have See. people looking at the website, watching the video feeds, and if they see anything, they can call the authorities to. So they don't have to do any work aside from answer the phone. No, you can do this from home. You can you you can watch from South Bend. No, I'm right? saying I'm saying about the about police paying people do at one point. The police wouldn't have. Yeah, to so so in in those cases you can probably put spikes and uh, electrocute them or something, right? But <laughs> birds are <laughs> off limit, right? So, um, and again again energy is a concern, right? Which is kind of counterintuitive because you would think that there's enough energy, but they were saying like you know all all the other issues. So. They were trying to figure out where to keep these the wind wind uh, vanes, where birds can't land on them, where it's still safe, it can still rotate and stuff. And um, they were still looking at it, and they're trying to see if they can put them out in the ocean and use the ocean energy and stuff, right? So regardless, I mean, so th those those are things you have to worry about for for these kind of a setup. Again, depending on what your assumption is, like for example, example the the London. Um, the, those set up, right? They're part of the infrastructure, so they probably don't have to worry about energy and stuff because it's probably wired to the um, power supply, right? So, like, if you talk to any of the, the people from England, right, they have, like, the technical people, they have really low opinion of what they actually do because they, they believe that the, the... So, they, they were saying that there's not even any change in crime statistics because of the camera. Like, you would expect that there'll be a placebo effect where people look at the camera and assume that you shouldn't do crime, right? But that was not true either. So they actually thought that there's no effect for the camera except it's a monumental waste of uh, resources, right? So he was not worried about privacy because that he was, his point is the camera is so bad that you'll be happy if it notices there's a human being, right? So. Um, but it's, it's one of those things where the, um, the technical folks think of something and the, the government probably thinks of another uh, reason for that, right? Um, so, so, yeah. I guess one of the questions that I have is mm -hmm. they're watching the coast with these mm -hmm. cameras, but they're, for what I could tell, they could basically just do 320 by 240 resolution. Mm -hmm. um, so we just assume that that's enough to capture. I mean, because you got to believe that it's from a, a ways mm -hmm. away, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it, they're going to be looking, it's a small camera looking at a mm -hmm. wide, mm -hmm. wide enough area. Like, mm -hmm. it's just not that much information mm -hmm. captured in, in, mm -hmm. in that image. So, so you could, so Yes, 
that that's 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 a limitation of most academic research, right? Um, so, if you found out that you need like HD TV resolutions, right? If if that's what the oceanographers want, if they want like 1200 HD TV level, uh, like full 1920 by 1080 streams. Um, streaming to somewhere, right? If you ask the oceanographers, is that what you want, right? I'm sure they'll say yes. I mean, I'm sure they'll say do you want that much, right? But clearly, we, we can't do that, right? From the from the hardware perspective and the software perspective, right? So we could wait for technology to keep up, I mean, catch up to that area. So they would argue that if you were have to upgrade, you have to upgrade everything, right? You have to upgrade the the camera component, you have to upgrade the processing component, you have to upgrade the network component, and another technology is there for you to do that. Um, so, yeah, because hopefully it, it's just trivial, right? Well, because you know, reading the paper and stuff, I, I just I kept thinking like that's a very small image, and mm -hmm. it seems like if you're talking about tides and things like that, that um, they're very slow changes mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. those are hard to detect on really low mm -hmm. resolution. The, the, so. the, the, okay, forget about this one, right? Like even the deployed one in the Caspian Sea, right? So I was asking him, does anyone actually like sit and watch all the 1200 cameras to see if there's any anybody like, you know, blowing up, trying to blow up the pipeline, right? No, it's all recorded, right? Why would he do that, right? Can you just process it to see if there's any big change? You know, like, have it set up to where it has like takes one iframe and then you know which one the yeah and the Caspian Sea and then if you have anything big change in there it's going to need so th th that's the key right if you have anything big change you want to be noticed right so yeah. define big change uh, there's I mean if a block of data if your image if there's a huge mm -hmm block of data mm -hmm. that changes in one image mm -hmm. compared to the other, then you so say, hey, like look at give it. examples of why there'll be a big change. Well, like if you were looking at a pipeline and somebody walked in the image, if your resolution was high enough, yeah. your object would be big enough to where your change would be noticeable. Yeah, so like human being walking across yeah. would have a big change, right? Think of something else which will make a big change. Planes, birds. No. Star. Star. No, not, not planes, but I'm saying like these are like I don't know how it's set up, but let's assume there's a, like a big pipeline and it's watching somewhere, right? And so I don't think planes, I mean, if a plane is landing on the pipeline, we have serious issues, right? <laughs> so, um, but you have other stuff, right? Like fog going through, uh, like a uh, bear walking over. I mean, this is outside, right? So any of the other things. So, so Developing algorithm which figures out that it's a human being that has to be watched is not that trivial, right? Because there could be other... Well, there's, well there, I mean, how many different things are going to come into the frame each day? I mean, how many bears are walking across a pipeline each day? Oh, this is a long... I mean, this is like, you know, a thousand or so it's, miles, it's right? it's pretty wide. I don't think a bear can get over it. Well, no, no, I'm saying bear is as big as a human being, right? So whatever a human being can do, a bear can be doing the same thing, right? Um, so you assume that the human being doesn't like kind of fly up and like land on top of this stuff, right? So you're kind of walking over, it looks like a bear, I mean, you get the, the thing, right? So whatever human beings can do, I think bears can do. They're probably bigger, but they can, they probably don't have any intention of doing something. But um, the other thing I was asking is, so if there's, if they're out there, right? So if you were, assume that you're a terrorist and you want to blow up this thing, right? How would you blow this up? Dress up as a bear. No. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm saying like, like one way is for you to actually walk up to the pipeline and put a bomb like in plain view of these cameras and do the stuff, right? Can you think of another way to do this stuff? Shoot a missile. Exactly, right? Yeah. So then you actually, like in the video, you actually see this thing come and hit this thing, right? So. Um, well, then you could turn off the pipeline. But that you could do anyway, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sure like when, when this explodes, there's a drop in pressure, right? Um, so I didn't know what they were trying to do, and 
this is the guy from Honeywell, so he's selling the product, so he was happy to sell this stuff. Right? He, doesn't, he doesn't care, they got money to throw around. So he said the, the ultimate goal was to have 10,000 cameras, and I was like very surprised that they can actually run 10,000 cameras off to a central site, right, to see 10,000 cameras worth of feed, which is a, which is a lot, right? So it turns out they every, like on the pipeline, apparently there's like an office every so often. So eight or 10 cameras go to a PC, which is set along the pipeline, right? So every, let's say a mile, right? There's a station and has a server and eight cameras are hooked up to it. So you use this to get to 10,000 cameras. Well, how often do they have attacks? But the point to me is like, so what do you do this with this stuff? And he said, I can kind of send a cam command, to, you know, send a command to this camera to send the right frames off to see the <coughs> stuff, right? So I was like, so how do you know anything is happening? I mean, this is like, if you say 10, like, so let's say 1,000 miles stuff, right? How do you, like, what do you do with it? I mean, like, that, that's such a such lot of data. Right? Even, if it, even if it's all stored somewhere, how do I say, I want to look at mile number, you know, 89, 890, and look out, you now give me all the streams, right? Does the office stream that to a central section, or is it just... Well, you can't, because you can't scale to that level. So the guy goes home for sleep, <laughs> no one's watching. No, so you, you actually need 890 people, I mean, 800, I mean, 1,000 people, right? So, um, so, yeah, so they would like algorithms like this, where it's all completely monitoring itself, rather than having a human being look at the stuff. Why do they just tape $100 bills every couple, like, 100 feet? So I have no idea what people do with uh, oil pipelines, right? So um, your guess is as good as mine. Mine is ridiculous. Well, like in, in Detroit, people put like a dollar bill, they'll tape it to the window so people won't break the window. They'll put a little note, please just don't break the window, take a dollar. How sad is that? That's <laughs> <laughs> what? I, yeah, I, I know people at Wayne State University, they, they do that in the parking lot because people will break their windows. Oh, they, they, Dollar is enough for that? Huh? Dollar is enough for I that? Yeah. So I was just thinking if it, you know you could apply the same kind of concept to an oil pipeline. You probably want more money, right? <laughs> Actually, like like somebody broke into my car in in Chicago, and took the kid's diaper bag, which looks oh. very obviously like a diaper bag because there's like diapers like like sticking out. <laughs> I mean, he needed diapers. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> but, anything else we have to take? What? Was there anything else we have to no. take? No. See? So he felt like yeah, an idiot. Take something. <laughs> yeah. No, but you can see inside. The window, you can see. This is why some people leave their cars open. Because they, at least that way they don't break their lock. But like, because but like all I had was the lock before they break the window. Oh no, people will open the door. I'm going to try. But, Makes yes. Don't worry, I locked my car too. <laughs> but, uh, I don't, yeah, I don't know if I locked it or whatever, but they, they, because like you know this, you, you see like you know diaper bags are pretty obviously diaper because it's, it's like spilling with diapers, right? So um, maybe you thought you were trying to trick them. With what? You know, <laughs> with, else with like soil diapers inside, so they can like, oh yeah, I don't know. But anyway, so okay, whatever. So um, so we, so so the, the, the cynical part in me would say I have no idea what people are trying to do with this stuff, but. As researcher, we just want to try these things, right? So I, I still have no clue what, why we have those in that corner, right? Obviously, like in in the uh, no, not not here on the on the street corner, right? The 23 and um, Edison, right? That that big junction, right? There's a lot of cameras looking over that junction, right? Or maybe when no, university camera. traffic for football games, though. Better traffic flow, specifically on game days. How do you do that? I don't know. <laughs> I'm saying, like, okay, so let's, let's, let's assume that all this camp video video feed goes to somewhere, right? And let's assume there's somebody sitting, like, there's somebody sitting and monitoring all this stuff. And here's what I'm thinking he's gonna, like, he or she's gonna say, like, oh, look, it's like no traffic jam, traffic jam. Oh, yeah, finally, there's traffic jam, right? Like, uh, if there's a big traffic jam, right? What do they do? They call the cops? They change the lights, or they laugh at them. Well, they, they could they could change the uh, if they had access to the the timing grid for the lights, they could make it very efficient. So you believe that that's what's no, going to do the kids? I'm saying you could do that. I'm not saying they do do that. Well, are they video cameras? Or they traffic cameras? Like you take you take it from the light. I don't think we I don't think we get ticket. I mean, 
I definitely have gotten tickets out of state. But the, the, the one thing I noticed have them all over the place. They have so the one thing I noticed when I moved to Indiana is like if the traffic light turns orange, that's okay, right? If the traffic light turns red, then the traffic like following kind of tends to s slow down, right? I don't know how many of you like driven in other states notice that like if the light turns orange, people still keep driving, right? And if the light turns red, then it be, people behave like orange in other states, right? Where people like it's, here, it's, here there's it's, a difference in the laws because of snow. So you can legally enter an intersection when it's yellow, as long as you have cleared it by the time it turns. Oh, but like I see people, people enter the intersection when it is right. clearly red, right? It happens all the time. So in India, I kind of like I'm, I'm kind of afraid that if you see red light, you know, light turned red. Um, yeah, I mean, like people are still going through, right? Whereas in New York, if you if the light turns red, you better stop because otherwise the, this other traffic is gonna kill you, right? Or they, they drive like that in Detroit. I like it in India where like they have these timers that tell you how many seconds are left oh. for it to be red. Oh, but so like five seconds before so I'm saying like, that's green, everybody's going. <laughs> oh, India, India is like fun to drive. But anyway, so it's like yeah, right? So I don't think they're gonna give a ticket for that because then they have to have this internal law that says that you know, like, what's the yeah, so I think if they start giving a ticket here, I think a whole bunch of people will get a ticket, right? So I don't think it's a ticket. So I don't know what, what they're doing with this camera, right? But there's cameras pointing at this stuff, right? I wish that they would take it more might people be for, might be testing. for doing that, right? Because there's they're everywhere. Like, <laughs> you go and it turns green, and you're like, oh, okay, shift in the first, get it. <laughs> oh, no, no, if they go fast like that, I, I won't be so pissed. You see this person like go like <laughs> slowly like the way they were going before. <laughs> you're like you're running a red light. At least pretend like you're like running a red light, right? But they just go like you know. <laughs> like especially on the like the like big intersection, right? You see this one little guy like kind of slowly going across and there's like you know there's traffic going like this and there's these people are trying to turn, they all go like this and you look at, you give a nasty look to this person and he's giving a nasty look like, I'm just running a red light, what is, what's your problem, right? <laughs> so, um, I got flipped off by a soccer mom in a minivan because <laughs> she ran the light and I went like, what? Yeah, and then she'll come back and say like, what's the problem? I'm just running a red light, right? Like, what's? Like, I'm about to go. And then I honked at her and she looked at me and she gave me the finger. Like, yes. <laughs> Dude, that's green for me. What is she spring running a red light, right? What's your problem, right? Anyway, so, um, so like when I first came here, I was like so scared to drive in Indiana because it's like everybody's running a red light, right? And now I have to remember that wow, figure other states. <laughs> well, I heard in India and China they have problems with a lot of drivers because when they see like big billboards, they'll turn the steering wheel with them. In <laughs> India? Because they're not they're not used to the advertisements and driving with. Oh no, no. actually, actually, I think in India you don't assume anything. The only assumption you do is like that the car in front of you would not go up. Right? <laughs> Anything else is possible. Right? So if you make any assumptions like like you know like there's lights and all those things, you get into accident. Right? <laughs> so no, no, they don't, I don't think they. I don't. I never seen anyone look at the anything else on the side because they know that anything can happen. So you have to monitor the whole. Uh, when we went, like we have pictures of like the cars coming on the wrong side of the road and everything, and, and that's everybody all fine. avoid them. Like you move out of the way. Yeah, I mean, like it, it's 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 not a big. I mean, yeah. nobody like you know they finger or something because right? yeah, you expect fast. those. So if you just habitually got on the wrong direction of the freeway, um, there's no freeway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they they do have freeway now. Oh, freeway, yeah, except it has stoplights. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 like the, the, they do have. Like, I was pretty surprised that they actually have freeways. Like the one from like Bangalore to Madras, there's actually a freeway with toll road and everything. But they have a toll road, and they have like a middle uh, divider where you can cross and everything. But that doesn't mean so. They have a divider, which means that if you are from point A to point B, like here, you have to go to the next exit, turn around, and come back and go like this, right? So that means you are wasting gas for this. One kilometer or something. <laughs> so they just like they just get on the whichever way and then they're going on the wrong side, right? <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's a freeway. Yeah, it's just like it's like you know it's like same like here you have like you know three lanes and you have like rest areas and stuff and then suddenly you see this like car going across or, um, and and you can't do anything because like the only way you can say that is you have to tell the people okay so the way to avoid this is for you to go this way 
turn around and come back this way, right? And they're not going to pay the like, yeah. gas to go that way, right? They're like, who's going to pay for this gas, right? So. <laughs> well, what they do, like, a lot, it, at least back home, to avoid this, they do this really sharp kind of deep median. So there's no way a car can go through it. And every once in a while you're driving, you see a car stuck in the middle of the median oh. because he's attempted to cross it and then you got stuck in the middle. And then, like, they can't move it back or forth because the wheels are flying and the car is just there. So, th th like, that's why in India they don't even try. They just yeah, go on the other side, right? Yeah, they're on the wrong side. They don't even try and cross the median. They just get on the wrong side. So, that, that's what I'm saying. You, you never assume anything. You never assume that since you're going in this road that, that all cars are going this way, right? Yeah. Wow. But you know that cars rarely take off. So, that you know, <laughs> right? But anything else is possible, right? So, it's complete mayhem. Pretty much. Like for you and me, but for them they're fine. Like nobody, yeah. nobody will complain that you see a car this way. Right? They're like, oh, that's fine. Right? So you just, you just try to find a way around and go. Anyway, so no, my, my my point still is we have no idea what people do with these cameras. Right? So we can't really complain about this research because we have no idea how useful these things are. We have no idea what people do at Walmart. So if you go to like Walmart or Target or whatever, right? See how many cameras are out there. Uh, watching you, right? Actually, this is this is another thing I heard that the the target camera is supposed to be like extremely good quality. They can actually figure out what you did, right? So, um, one of the author in this one, the Uchi uh, person, right? So his wife actually went and bought something, and she was charged for something she didn't do, right? So she went and complained that you know she only bought like say one item, and she was charged for two items. And she complained, and after a while, uh, the guy came back and said, "Yes, you didn't. You, you only took one, right?" And she was like, "Wow, how did you know, right?" So the, the 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 picture quality they have is good enough that they can actually see how much she had, what she did, and everything. So it, it's constantly monitoring. So it, so I was like, "How did they figure?" So I, I think she went back after a couple of days. So how did they figure out when she was there, right? Based on when the ticket was done, everything. So he was very surprised. So apparently, I think Target is one of the largest video surveillance things in the world, right? Because they have all these cameras which are collecting everything. So next time when you go to Target and you want to do something illegal, um, it's all being captured in high fidelity, right? Well, that's one of the biggest problems, I don't know around in the US, but worldwide, the problem is uh, those stores they lose a ton of money people stealing stuff. Mm -hmm. so they're going to keep monitoring them, and I guess high quality video is one of the easiest way of doing it. But, but 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 again, the problem is somebody has to watch them, right? Um, it it's I don't think you can use automated <coughs> system to figure out if somebody's stealing something. I mean, if I steal something like something large or something, you can probably figure out. But um, I thought it's 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 only a, like a effect that you know people see this camera, they won't steal something. But it, it's all recorded, so I guess they can go back and uh, arrest you um, after. And uh, because. Target, I think, in the one in Minneapolis, they have the, the center which tries to, so they're, they're training the law enforcement on what, how to um, use recognition. So that's that's part of their um, their, their work, right? They, they run um, department store and also how to do surveillance um, effectively for Homeland Why Security. Why just put a RFID tags and everything? And then when you, when you scan it, you mm -hmm. can have it deactivate the tag. Mm -hmm. So otherwise, it's because it, it, I think it's a cost right okay. now. Right? So I don't think it's it's that expensive, but it's maybe like a few pennies, right? Oh, that's coming, right? That that's that's what Walmart wants to do. That's what all these guys want to do. Um, it's still not free, but um, yeah, eventually that's what you'll have, right? So. We got sidetracked on from where we are, right? So again, like if you're trying to build these things, you have to figure out how how they are integrated. Um, so if you have hardware background, you probably can build this device with a camera built on uh, into it, right? The, the annoying part with 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 the video sensors rather than temperature sensors is temperature sensors. You don't have to actually keep them at, at viewing the angle, right? You can put the temperature sensors down there and they are fine. So you can put them on the motherboard and they are fine. You can put temperature, humidity, and all those things on the motherboard, you are fine. Here you have to be able to put a camera somewhere, right? So you need to be able to connect those unless you're willing to move the whole computing device to face, uh, face stuff, right? 
<laughs> and there are different interfaces you can try. PCMCA is not very energy efficient because it's not designed for these kind of applications. Um, USB and fi uh, Firewire are fast enough to have good quality video, but if you if you have these the kind of devices that they have, the processor is not fast enough to take all the data that, even if you send them. <coughs> so they can kind of forced to do USB 1.1. So they actually they go through. Uh, enough detail on the paper, but they have separate papers on how to get video off of USB 1.1, right? So the, 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 the problem for them is uh, it, the, the theoretical maximum bandwidth is only 12 megabits per second, but worse, most of these cameras actually compress these images before they send it back to the PC. So you have one compression coming to the PC, so you have to decompress those images and then recompress them back to whatever you want, right? So since you're, you don't have enough processing power to begin with, this decompression and recompression uh, kills you, right? So you would like them to be in raw format, but raw format, there's not enough bandwidth to send raw. So the paper goes in details of what they can do with different, you know, 640, 220L, whatever they can do. And like Will, Will pointed out, yes, I mean, they can probably do, you know, 1620, 16, 160 by something, right? They could do. Uh, Let's have one quarter of 320 by 240, right? At, at 30 frames per second. But as they go higher, um, you have to have the processing power to do both of those stuff. And you need to worry about. They uh, could do 160 by 120 at good frame rates. But 320 by 240. So again, this is the computing research people talking. So we have no idea what the oceanographers want. If I was an oceanographer, I would I would think I would want 640 by 480, uh, maybe one frame a second, right? Because I don't think the ocean should be changing one thirtieth of a second. But uh, I, don't, I don't actually know how how much they talk to the oceanographers. I think they just have them as an example. But um, I don't think they so. As a, any academic project, this is never going to be deployed across the ocean, uh, Oregon coast, right? Because if you're going to do this, um, think of all the so how hard this is going to be, right? One of the one of the hardest problems with the, with the sensor network research is somebody has to go put these things up. Somebody has to like dig up the hole, put this thing up, um, and usually you don't have the money to put this up, so you have to have graduate students, right? So one of the graduate students is going to join an apple seed kind of thing, right? They're going to put this stuff across the. You're saying. Well, I mean, I guess they're going to use solar panels, but I was going to say normally you have to power them and all that. So somebody has to dig up the hole. Yeah. Somebody has to make sure that it's illegal and everything, and then like dig up a hole, put this thing up there, and water them. Go to the next Johnny Apple seed story. I don't know, uh, kind of thing. Right? So you're going to walk across the thing. If something breaks down, somebody has to go back and fix those things, right? So. Um, and you get no credit for it because you cannot publish something saying, I spent the last 10 years planting cameras across Oregon <laughs> Coast, right? So, so you, you, you don't tend to do a whole many, bunch of those. So the next issue is buffer management. So since you can't, so one way you want is you want all the streams to come to the central node, but you don't have the network bandwidth. You don't have the bandwidth or resources to deal with, let's say, 1,000 cameras sending, let's say, 5 megabits per second. So you're getting five gigabits per second worth of data, which means that everything along the way is forwarding that much traffic. You just can't do that, right? So you want some kind of buffering where some of the content stay in the camera, then you want to have intelligent way of saying what frames you want. So hopefully you can say, that is the camera I'm interested in. You send the data right now, right? So you can achieve some kind of uh, um, balancing where everybody maintains a buffer, right? And I only get the stuff that I, I'm, I'm interested in. So that that they, they, they were spending a lot of energy on trying to come up with how do you do that. So essentially, you have to figure out like the older frames you, you may want to throw out. So you want to have a variable um, rate encoding for the different images. You have to have some way of like sending commands to, to have you send the data back. Um, and the paper talks a little bit about that. They, they wrote separate papers on how to manage this buffering, how to manage sort of like the global buffer of all these cameras to make good stuff, right? So one of the stuff that we, like we wanted to look at was to have like a real disk attached to each of these cameras. So you have like a really big uh, buffer, right? Which makes life interesting or, or harder depending on how you look at it, right? So 
so the, 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 their main focus right now is on how to program these things, right? So if you make them static, if you know that bears are eight foot and you want to ignore anything which is eight foot, right, eight foot tall, then, um, you know, Shaq can be setting up these bombs and get through these, uh, he's not eight foot, but you know, something like that, right? So you want these things to be flexible, so you want to be able to program them, and there's a lot of interest in programming the sensor networks, right? It's a little easier if you're trying to program to figure out what the temperature is. It's a little harder because if you want to suddenly set a new encoding algorithm, instead of JPEG, you want to do a new encoding algorithms. You want to send this code across, right? You want to be able to control them. You want to send this code across. You hope they don't crash. If they do, it's not very easy to reboot these things because you have to, um, again, go back uh, on the stuff. So then that they're actually building a Python-based um, platform. So which is pretty good at like, doing the demo of bringing these things and using Python to um, do cool stuff with it. So essentially you can say, now turn this camera on, encode this, ca encode this JPEG, send this across here, do some processing, you know, do some simple recognition, and send the data back kind of stuff. Um, so you, you essentially treat the whole sensor network as a object-based system, right? Where each object you can control kind of thing. And again, this is a rich, rich area of, for people to uh, look into. And the, and the last area is how do, how do you interact with this thing? Right? So you don't want to bring all the 1,300 videos and plot them into a big screen or something. So you want to be able to say what is what you're interested in, what, is, what you want to bring. So earlier, the, the first paper that they did, one of the motivating examples was in the lab, apparently somebody was stealing all the food, right? So they had set this up and monitoring it overnight and found out that it's actually a rat coming through something to take the food, right? So they actually have the sequence show that rat, you know, was coming to take this food. Yes? Um, I was just thinking, oh, sorry. Well, I, I just had a thought about the cameras on the ocean shore. Could okay. they just sample like once a minute? Like, I mean, they're looking for changes over a So the, 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 the adaptive part says that that sounds like reasonable stuff. Like sampling every minute sounds like reasonable, right? But if they find that one is not enough, so if they find that all cameras have to operate every like millisecond level, you just can't do it because the system can't deal with that, right? But if they want to say like these cameras should be operating every second and these should be operating every minute, right? Better yet, if they think, if you see the, like, uh, I don't know if you can see it, but if you see the, the high tide kind of the coming through. So if you kind of send the information across where the all the cameras start like you know firing in, in tandem or something, then you want this kind of flex flexibility, right? You, know, you don't want to be stuck with that one global uh, stuff across the whole whole thing. Um, yeah. So in in the case of the rat, they found out that they were pretty psyched that you you know they saw this rat coming down and taking the food, right? But turns out that's, that's not such a trivial thing because the university has to be involved, so you have to make sure that you're not doing any animal cruelty, so you have to do the, um, take it to the ethics panel. There's ethics panel which figures out if whatever research you're doing is ethical and stuff, right? So they have to argue that we didn't do anything with the rat. Um, so they have to argue that this is, the rat is being treated ethically. And then guess what happened what they did to the rat? Yeah, so, but that's a separate department, right? So they have to prove that it's not, nothing ethical is being done, and the other department came and figured out where it's coming from and then backed it, right? It's kind of like strange, because you have to make sure that it's not treated ethically, unethically, so you can kill it, right? But, so that, that's, that's, one of, so that's one of the reasons why they found that they have to change a whole bunch of this stuff, because they assume that once you turn off the light, that, things don't usually happen, um, and it turns out rats come in one day, once it's dark, right? And even, even one of the things that I was trying to look at here, um, I was trying to see when the, I don't know, I think I mentioned to some other people, right? When, when the janitor walks into my office, because I have a camera pointing at my direction, right? So I can, I can set it to trigger when there's motion. So I want to actually see when the janitor comes in and, and changes the stuff. And, and you never see them, because the janitors usually come in in the morning, and they usually don't turn on the light because they know where, I guess from the outside, they can see where the thing is. So they just go in the dark, take the stuff out, and put the stuff back in. 
the only reason why I know they were there because there's a, a LED light somewhere, so you see them like kind of block it for a moment, right? So if you develop an algorithm which is looking at motion, that would have shut down at night, right? Because the threshold is so small. All you see is like this one light blocked, then comes back, then again blocked because they come take the thing, go out, then come back and put it, right? Then you infer there's a human being. So you would want it to be able to say, if it's dark, do this other algorithm. If it's light, do this other algorithm. But that you may not have known before you did this, right? So you want it to be programmable, right? So that's, that's pretty much it. Like this, this is, after 9-11, there's a lot of interest in this kind of, a, this kind of a research. Um, and as you can imagine, there's a lot of challenges because it brings in all the recognition and all those, you know, video image recognition, all those things with the sensor kind of deployment kind of stuff, right? Um, that's about it. Yes, so I'll send you an email to remind you. Uh, so uh, if you wanted to take the homework assignment, let me know, or else I'll wrap the grades into the thing. Yes? What do we have to do for the um, progress updates for next week? Yeah, you have us down as giving the progress reports. Yeah, so I, 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 some of you email email oh, me something. It. Oh, that's, that's all you wanted. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll send I'll send you a response back saying more information. Oh, right? oh. Okay. Some of you gave like more details. Some of you just said two or three lines. I want to know. Oh, sorry, uh, I, I didn't think that was the progress report. Yeah. Okay, you can write a you may better report, but yeah. uh, started. Uh, 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 yeah, I don't know how much more there is this. Well, I guess there's more details. Yeah, I can send you an email because the class is not big enough. Right? Oh no, that's fine. I, I just the, I, I was confused yeah. what you were asking since we had the big one coming up. So I just figured you wanted something like question. Uh, but yeah. we can give you a more yeah. in depth. Yeah. Hey guys, so um, I 